All right, so I have two new pieces here that I'm going to critique. I had a little bit of extra time, so I sort of jumped into Procreate and I did these. If you would like to have your work critiqued, please go to the New Masters Academy community forums. You don't need to have an active subscription to do this. We are offering this as a free service to the community during the COVID crisis. Let's go ahead and jump in. I'm gonna do a quick critique here. This is a really nice little piece here. Reminds me of uh, children's uh, illustrations. It's I like the watercolor. I like the sense of it's like the tone of it. It just seems very fun and very nice. Um, we've got sort of it's got a flat characteristic, almost as if the character was built out of like cutouts, like a paper doll, a posable paper doll, which might be the look you're going for. But generally speaking, I would recommend we put an emphasis on three dimensional form. And shape is really nice, but shape can work in a three-dimensional illusion. It's part of how we perceive 3D. So generally speaking, I, I push things towards the three-dimensional. One issue I have with this piece is that we it's unclear where what's happening. I, I see, obviously we see the feet here. Let me go ahead and... Uh, okay, we... We know for sure where these feet are, um, but it's not clear which foot we're looking at because they're 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 painted almost the same, and the interior of a foot and the exterior side of a foot, the lateral and the medial sides don't look the same, and shoes aren't designed identically on both sides. So the legs could be crossing for all I know. I, I can't tell because this looks to me like a leg, almost as if she's thrown one leg over another knee here it almost looks to me like like this is going back in space and then this is where our foot would be and then maybe this is where our other foot would be because of these shapes it's, or maybe this leg is just coming up this way and this one is and then the, the other leg is lower. Um, I just can't tell. It, it, it's uh, it's unclear. The only thing that's clear is that there are feet there, there's an arm there, and then the upper body is a, is a little bit more obvious what's happening. So I don't think there's any artistic reason, or at least I don't think there's a good reason we want to do that in a, in a situation like what we're seeing here. I think we want more clarity. We can still push the nice shapes and the 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 characteristics, the the personality of what you have. But I think what you need to do, uh, my recommendation for you is to clarify and figure out where this figure is in space. Almost like we're drawing a simple uh, mannequin. And then once you figure that out, you'll you'll realize, okay, is the pose I'm trying to do natural? Is it possible? which maybe that doesn't matter too much to you, but you'll have more of a, you'll have more of a um, clear understanding of what needs to happen to change it. So just as simply as I can, I'm gonna try to sort of pose something in a way that maybe can justify what it looks like you've uh, tried, tried to do here. This is just loose and it's mostly, it's mostly for me so I can see what's possible. We've got this sort of turning back and looking over the shoulder. It's kind of a renaissance idea. And then opening up the rib cage and then coming back down. I think that's it's a nice, it's a, just gesturally, it's a nice kind of a pose. So we just sort of need to make a little more sense of this, I think, to make it work. So let's 
bring this down a little bit. And you notice in some of my other critiques, I, I get into um oh so I'm just need to focus on what I'm doing. A lot of times I get into a lot of the nuts and bolts of how the how the sculpture or the sculptural qualities of the drawing. But first, before we before we can do that, we need to figure out overall what's going on. So, okay, this so this material is sort of this whatever she's sitting on here. This whether it's magical or whatever, it's coming over, and then maybe it's almost like there's this cascading quality to it. It's going away in space. Looks to me like almost like there's like a stair stepping kind of a like almost as if she's on a ledge, like a mossy ledge. And then maybe this stuff is going back into the distance. But she's sort of sitting up. So let's move that down. She's sort of sitting up on it, like against the ledge. Like a little kid, maybe, who, a child who climbed up somewhere high and fun, maybe somewhere she's not supposed to be, and is uh, enjoying the view. There's a like a youthful feeling about this piece. I don't know if the character is intended to be a child. The head's rather large, so that might be the case. But basically, we're we're sitting on an edge, and so from the story part of it, that's, I think, probably important that that is going on, that we're seeing it. And then one question I would have just looking at this is, uh, where is she looking? Because she seems to be looking up this way, and yet our line of sight, if there is one, seems to be here. So she's not looking at us, and she's already what appears to be like up on this ledge. So she's looking up high and to the left. It's a little confusing because I would think that if she's if she really has climbed up onto this sort of cliff, if that's really what's going on, the sky is behind her, if she's looking up, it has to be maybe looking out at a landscape or looking at a bird or something that's high up. But because of the nature, if you put somebody, you know, if you put somebody up on a up on a building, let's say, and then they are looking up, it, it begs the question, well, what's what's going on? Maybe she's intended to be looking at us. Uh, maybe that makes more sense, uh, depending on the narrative of your story. So it, it's got a nice feeling to it, but I am curious, and it sort of bugs me a little bit. Where I'm like, well, what is she? You know, what is she looking at? It's not clear. So maybe you know, maybe it makes more sense for the character to be looking at us, and so we focus more on you know her her playfulness, sort of like, oh yeah, come and sit with me, you know. Come over here. That sort of fun feeling. Maybe that is. Maybe that's more. And also, it looks like you know maybe she's got flowers in her hands. That the hand, the forearm, supinated like this turned out. It doesn't feel too natural. Um, you can do it, but it's sort of like the anatomical pose. It's not something you're gonna just naturally sit there and do unless maybe you're doing meditation, dance, martial arts, or something. So if her intention is to be holding on to or maybe letting some of the flowers go, it doesn't it seems a little bit like an awkward way to do that, maybe. You know, and, and that shoulder is pulled up so much this way that also it doesn't feel natural. Um so I maybe think of changing that arm position. Also, this arm is just sort of it's just disappearing behind, and so that's ambiguous where that is and so we wonder and it doesn't emerge anywhere else so maybe maybe we, we give the viewer the hand I think maybe it's uh, maybe it's here and it's resting on her leg so that we don't have to wonder where that is and then maybe maybe I mean if it's a languid kind of a if it's a languid kind of a pose Maybe then she, her she's going this way and she's maybe she's releasing 
these flowers that are being taken by the wind. Maybe it's more like that, like her arm is crossing her body and, and then it's opened up. And these flowers are being taken by the wind. And I don't know if that's the intention here, but it almost does seem to me like there is like a, a wind element here. And so if that's true, maybe with her hair, like let's say the wind is coming over, like the wind can even be like a compositional element. So let's say the wind is just carrying away these flowers that she's holding. So maybe her hair can give us some of that. So as we're thinking about the pose, like I'm, ask, I'm asking you to clarify where this is in three-dimensional space. And then as I'm thinking about this with you, I'm sort of sort of simulating the, the idea of what I, of where I want you to kind of be thinking. You're noticing probably that, wow, this is all, it's, it's, it's becoming about story. So the story of the piece, the intention of the piece and the composition, those are intertwined and those um, dot in this kind of uh, um, picture where we are getting us like it's you know it's fantastical it's almost like a fantasy or ro it's it's a romance it's an illustration it gives us um, a feeling but if we're figuring out well, wh well where are her legs or what's she looking at um, it that probably runs counter to what you want so we need to kind of see okay there's this girl like I can't tell like I said if she's a teenager or a child or an adult because of the proportion, the ambiguity of the proportions, like the nose and the cheekbones look more adult to me. And yet the proportions and even the carefree manner is more childlike. So you, I don't think you want your viewer thinking, oh, is this a, you know, is this a child or an adult? Or is she sitting on a ledge or is she like down by the river? Like is she, because she looks high up to me because I'm seeing all the, you know, these clouds, all this nice stuff happening up here. So I don't know where she is and, and our line of sight feels lower. So it feels more like we're looking up at her. So the impression you know I'm getting from this is that we are, and let's, and you can do like what I'm doing in lots of little thumbnail sketches, just working out the idea. You can do this with uh, uh, digitally like this. You can do this with transparency, but we wanna even the, in our framing, we wanna be thinking about this, like maybe, Let's say she is sort of how I was interpreting it, where she's like up on the ledge kind of a thing. Like she's just climbed up somewhere and then she's letting flowers drift down. If that's true, then um, how we frame her will will be helpful. Like maybe we shouldn't be seeing the, you know, the tops of her shoes or the side. Maybe we should be seeing the bottoms. You know, maybe we're getting this kind of, the seams are doing this. So maybe we're, maybe we're looking up at her and that needs to be more of the feeling. Everything is sort of pushing, the curve is, is, is all pushing that way. That might, that might give us, um, a, cause that, that's, that's, I think I, that's what I like about the piece is that it's like, it's like a young girl or, or, or at least a, a youthful character who's climbed up onto this high up hill and is um, releasing these flowers into the wind. It's a very inviting, carefree thing. So I would think about, as I was saying, let's maybe we, maybe she's looking at us and she's inviting us. Maybe that's the, uh, maybe that's the idea is that she's inviting us to come and join her. And that's a feeling that I, that's a feeling that I, I like. So maybe we should, the body shouldn't be so contorted, how it kind of appears. Maybe it should be more fun and carefree. And then this is opening up and she's releasing this. And maybe, you know, so I have to, maybe I have to put this going back into space more because just to make room in the frame. And then maybe these flowers are leaving, but then they could be coming back. Like they've, the flowers have been dropped and then they're coming back when she's releasing these flowers and the wind is taking it, or maybe we want to show more of the path of these flowers that she's letting go of. So maybe they need to, to move more like this. So work out your, 
work out your story more and the placement and the and the composition more you know like if we bring crop down closer to her head i think she's going to feel like she's higher up in the frame and then maybe all of this nice almost like flower like treatment of the clouds is, is really beautiful but this could be this could have more shape and movement so maybe it's and then as you're going to see by some of the other uh, instructors i don't know this will be shown first but from the design perspective you have to design your values so that there's clarity of what we're actually seeing here so for example you've got the sort of hill or whatever she's sitting on is dark and then as it moved back into space it seems like it gets lighter so we've got this heaviness and then you've actually got like a vignette happening because there's looks to me like there's like nothing like this is the like the background here so it's 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 uh, almost like a nouveau uh, an art nouveau kind of idea where there's like this vignetting happening it happens here and doesn't happen anywhere else so if you you are going to do that vignetting thing then maybe you know we see the page or we see the um the background that's here up here as well and in here so that we know oh you know this is like a vignetted uh piece like american illustrators people like lion decker and rockwell a lot of these a lot of these guys would use the th those techniques and then we got to decide okay so if this is all light this is all high key in here then maybe her hair is separating her the dark hair is separating her from the background and maybe this is a like sort of a middle tone but overall maybe she is a darker a darker shape against the background and maybe like you have maybe these shoes are popping out more her hair is like a identifiable shape and becomes part of the uh see what it looks like if we just make her darker so then maybe then the um it could be that the the cliff is darker than her like she's a dark shape and this fades out but she's not as dark as the area she's sitting on so she's sort of like maybe turned away like maybe the sky here is where the primary illumination is coming from and she's a dark shape so that if we were to just see it as a so if we were to just see this as a thumbnail a thumbnail image it could be that her silhouette is how we're able how we are able to tell that this is a girl who is sitting on a ledge of some kind and that her shoes maybe it's almost like the the way you've done it it's almost like these shoes are like part of the story or like an iconic part of this character but her shoes can say give us oh wow there's the placement there's there her there's her feet so we've got her silhouette and there's her feet and then as i was saying with the arms like maybe if Maybe this is the hand and then this arm is reaching over and then she's dropping her wrist out and she's releasing these flowers. It's like swooshing and bringing us around. Um, and this could actually be, again, relative to the background, darker. Or, you know, we could switch, like think of Tintoretto, think of MC Escher. You know, think of uh, people that have played the darks against lights and then alternating lights against darks. So this could actually be a light against the, uh, against a darker background. Maybe these flowers, but you have white in your composition are there. And then maybe, okay, so we're getting our illumination from back here. If that's really the case, then maybe we do have like she's in shadow because illumination's behind, but it could be that we've got a rim, a rim light situation. And this is being illuminated and that's being illuminated, and but a lot of this is 
is hidden to us. And then it's brighter behind her. And maybe we can make these really noticeable. Like I'm not sure the vignetting is needed here, if that is what you're doing. I could be misinterpreting it. But I'm not sure that the vignetting is, is necessary. I'd almost lose this and focus more on the um, focus more on the just a clear a clear shape read here. So um, figure out. I mean, and you can use. I mean, you can use an actual artist mannequin. I know the ones you buy today kind of are terrible. They can't really pose very well. I mean, there's apps out there. I, I have designed an artist mannequin of my own. Um, I'll make a recommendation that's not like good advice for everybody because there's only a few, but if you can go on eBay or go online and buy a vintage mannequin, like especially ones, I mean, the older, the better really, but ones from the 1920s and thirties from the United States, for example, they're, they're much more posable. They're much nicer, but it would be useful for you to pose something or take the pose yourself and have someone take a picture of you or have someone sit for you because you need to kind of work out where the the spatial uh where, where the where the spatial relationships are where how we are sitting in space i think we need to think of that and i mean one way that they, that uh goes back to the renaissance and before that again tintoretto uh Poisson, michelangelo uh a lot of these old masters would make little figures out of wax so you don't need to have a mannequin you could if you if you just have some uh some sculpting wax or some clay you could pose out a little character that's really simple like let's say it's it's literally it's just a shape like this for the uh, rib cage and you are thinking about the proportions and maybe it's and then you have just a shape here and then you the nice thing about this is that you you get your three-dimensional um characteristics just by maybe this is coming over just by working this out, it'll help you think of it. And then, so you can just make like a simple little figurine. I do this I do this myself. I go back and forth between 3D and 2D. But just making a little figure, crude, crude as it might be, I, I prefer that to any kind of mannequin because um, it's more mobile. You can do more poses and it helps you figure out what you're trying to say. So then, then you can do a little, like let's say you have a little cliff you've built, like a little mound. I mean, this isn't clay, it's small, and you can turn it and think about it, and you can work, work out the pose, and then we go back into sort of two-dimensional thinking, and then we work out you know, the value relationships, the pictorial side of it. So more storytelling, uh, more construction, more thought, and try to see the piece as if you have never seen it before. Like, look at your pieces if you don't know anything about the story, just like I am. I'm just, I'm the viewer. I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm trying to understand it. Do the same thing with your piece. And you can even, like, <laughs> troll yourself a little bit. Like, oh, what am I looking at here? Okay, there's a girl. What's she doing here? You know, like, just try to look at it fresh. And if there are things that you really like about your piece, which, like, I like the, the, the treatment. I like the watercolor feeling of it. I don't know what the material is. But I like the, the colors and the mood. I like the feeling of it. If that's how you feel that will make it into the final version. We don't have to worry about that. Like I, in these little thumbnail studies, I don't need to worry about, uh, you know, preserving this kind of stuff because you can get it in. And so you can bring the best parts or how you sort of like, almost like um, in Chinese art, like in Japanese art, they use a pattern here, like almost like they're little stamps. Um, you could, or like a, like a Japanese woodblock print. You could still bring those back, but you can switch gears into a different way of drawing. And for every finished painting, and certainly for every masterpiece, there are probably many studies done. Um, for example, like Bernini, as a, I'm, I'm primarily a sculptor, so on the sculpting side, Bernini, for one of his uh, sculptures, did uh, 22 maquettes. So 22 different models in order to work out the composition for one piece. And so, for every finished piece we might see of yours, you know, there can and probably should be like a sketchbook full of ideas where you're working these uh, relationships off against each other. And so I think that would be a, 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 my advice for you is I'm talking about thinking of this stuff through doing thumbnails, 
uh, working out more three-dimensionally, but also just try lots of variations. Because if you were to try several variations of this um, even just the shape breakdowns, like even just the matrix, like, okay, is she here? Is she, maybe, maybe we're seeing the feet and we're looking up at her. And then all of the, all, all of the story, like that beautiful sky is back here and the flowers are here. And you can try all of these uh, different versions. Maybe, maybe we are like right now, we seem like we're more on top of her. Maybe it's like the cliff if it really is a cliff is here and we're sort of walking up behind her and she's like, we can see this beautiful stuff happening here. And she's looking back at us like, Hey, come, come sit next to me. So it's through trying out different things. And that's, you know, we all see when we're looking at the old masters, like I just saw this before they shut it down at the Getty, this beautiful exhibition of Michelangelo's drawings at the, at the Getty museum. And before that I went to the, uh, the, the show they had at the Met and Personally, like I taught myself how to draw by copying each of the drawings of Michelangelo in these corpus, the, these books that were produced in the 60s and 70s. They're they're rare and they're um, hard to get. I got them at the Casa Buonarroti and I, I copied every drawing at, at, that existed of Michelangelo's, every facsimile at the time. And one thing I learned from that is when you when you look at these uh, art books, these, mon uh, these uh, monographs of these famous artists, you don't usually see like the sketches and the little fragments and all of the the, the things that didn't make the final cut. Like if you buy a, a book about Raphael, you're probably going to see just a tiny little selection of the drawings or the paintings that are out there of the artist. And that's even going to be an infinitesimally small set, uh, fragment of all of the works that these artists did. Like Michelangelo uh, famously, you know, had his had his assistants burn thousands of his drawings on his deathbed because he didn't want people to realize how hard he had to work to get his mastery. And so this kind of thinking here, you know, nowadays we associate this with animation, illustrators, you know, like maybe fine artists are, are doing this to some degree, but we don't really think of that from a fine art perspective, but that is the tradition of art. It's you're seeing the final product, but we are doing all of this work behind the scenes to make it happen. And so um, embrace that and lean into that and, and enjoy that because if if you know if you had a hundred different versions of these to work from, um, the one you're selecting is probably going to be better than the painting you did when it was your first choice. Sometimes you come back to where you started too. That happens as well. Like maybe your original idea was great, you know, maybe that, but at least you will have had the opportunity to develop this, and you're probably going to get more clarity in the storytelling of your piece and um, just a stronger piece at the end. So great job. Hello, Andres. Um, I'm really proud of you. You've grown so much as an artist. And even since uh, you were my student in person, I can see you've uh, improved quite a bit since then. So well done. Uh, this is you're, this is getting very advanced. There's so many nice things happening here. What I'm seeing here is that these smaller forms, these smaller features are getting, like there's a lot of subtle, nice things. You're working with dark accents to lead the eye. You have a sense of movement and even gesture happening in the face. So that on the one hand, there's really advanced things happening. And then on, and the proportions are nice too. You know, this is the middle of the head. It's the placement of the eyes, brows, base of the nose, uh, lower lip, opening of the mouth above that. Some of the, the drawing and rendering technique is really nice. So yeah, it's a bit uneven. In some ways it's advanced and then in, in, in other ways we're missing big things. And what I mean by that is it's this. this has always been my advice for you, and it, it still is, which is try to see the big sculptural forms. And in the case, like, ima like imagine a situation where we have the outline of this thing, and then within it, we have these interesting 
features. Maybe there's a tooth here. Maybe there's an ear and maybe maybe these are really, really well drawn. And it's really interesting, but they're floating in a um, in a sea of ambiguous form. And I'm exaggerating this like this is uh, it's like some Akira kind of a situation. <laughs> like I'm not I'm not trying to say that your your work looks like a tumor or something. But what I'm saying is that I think that the form is most important, the the most important thing. The shape is. Um, the two-dimensional shape is how we're viewing the three-dimensional form. So which forms are most important? Well, it depends on the composition, but generally speaking, the overall, the big forms are more important than the smaller forms that are on top of those forms. And that is the, that's the major issue. That's what we need to focus more on. So again, just like my little silly drawing back there, Oh, this is a previous one back here. Let me hide. So just like before, we've got these areas of high contrast and carefully shaped and drawn features, but they're floating in what is too vague, too ambiguous, too amorphous. So structure, like the big structure. And what the reason we don't draw that the big structure oftentimes is, you know, an inclination to copy. You know, outlines are easier to see. And we are fixated on these outlines. And then secondarily, we know, okay, well, you know, psychologically important. I need this eye, it's important. So then I'll go and do the eye. But again, this is just like another outline on the inside. And then, oh, okay, the mouth comes back to here. And oh, I can't forget to add in uh, this piece here of the wing of the nostril. So this is how most people draw. It's this outline, and then there's additional outlines that are on the inside, it's, it's, but it's, it's flat. And it, the illusion is less convincing if we, if we do it that way. And you're not completely doing this. You, you know, there is a lot of three-dimensional form here. You are turning turning forms and turning planes um, nicely in a lot of areas here but that's where you need to focus and that's where you need to put more of your time so let's just put let's just think a little bit about the overall masses of what we've got here let's forget we know it's a head and a face let's just think of it as like we're making this out of clay and we, we're sketching this out and we just need to Get where the big masses are, and so first of all, first of all, there's obviously I think you've drawn this pretty well, but there's this cranium form, which is like an egg tilted. It's like an egg because, like an egg, the head of the human has to come through the pelvic floor, and so the same reasons why a chicken would lay an egg, or a bird would lay an egg, or a reptile, the same shape properties apply to our skull. So an egg is not just a way of thinking about it. It's not just like a, I've heard it talked about. It's like a philosophical thing. It's not just that. It's literally like an egg because our head is an egg in a way. It's got in the, in, what, in the purpose of it and the design of it from an evolutionary standpoint. So there's, yeah, this cranium is up here. And then the face mask, the bones, the skeleton of the face hang down off of that. And in some animals, you know, this would project further but with us it's hanging down the at the level of the base of the ear and the nose we have the foramen magnum the opening of for the spinal column and the vertebrae to in, come up into the head and that is the sort of this halfway point from front to back is where our, our our spine is inserting it, swinging back. So there's a little bit of an issue here because this happens more or less. If we're in, I mean, I won't get too anatomical, but we're if we're in the Frankfurt plane, it's like an imaginary line that anthropologists used to set the, it's like the baseline of the skull, but we're not always sitting like that. So the head turns, obviously. In your case, you've got 
This is the relationship between the top of the ear and the brow. And then this is the relationship between the nose and, um, and the ear, the bottom of the ear, which tells us, hey, we're, you know, we're looking at the head from the side. Like you do have a little bit, like since we can see one eyebrow here and another eyebrow, you are saying it's slightly turned this way, but we're, we're, we're more or less level with it. And if that's the case, then the bottom of the cheekbone is gonna be somewhere in here. It's covered with this fat pad, and there's actually several fat pads but the bottom of the cheekbone needs to be here. The base of the skull, like we have the mastoid process back here, but one issue I'm seeing is that the, like the muscles of the neck are attaching here. So also I think we need more cranium. And then like, like I was just drawing up here, Here's our cranium. High point is often halfway, but it depends. Depends on the person. So, and then the spine is is, is coming up and, and, and entering the skull here. And C7 is back here. This is gonna be the hyoid bone. If you're saying this is your chin, diagastric plane, this is the larynx goes it's like a tube that goes down and gets buried i mean it just enters the the chest okay so some slight adjustments but overall most of what you've got there is is sort of generally in the right place but once i started drawing into here once i started drawing into here you're probably you know gulping <laughs> because it's like whoops I wasn't really thinking that much about that and and that's 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 my point is that yeah we're all going to be sensitive to this although i think there's a little problem with the mouth i can talk about but it's being sensitive to some of these structures that are not um psychologically as important like the structure of the cranium the, the cheekbone as it faces us on the side i said this on another critique but everyone tends to be artists tends to tend to be more sensitive here and then they ignore all of this but this is the widest point of the face. You know, this is coming towards us. This is going away. This is going away. And there's a lot of stuff here. So try to, generally speaking, try to think of all of the forms, especially the larger forms, as equally as important for now. They're obviously not equally as important because it depends on the, the, your artwork and it depends on the part of the body that is um interesting like features are interesting to us because from an evolutionary standpoint we need to see if somebody is aggressive or not or what their mood is how we communicate whereas the ears are less important because they're on the side of the head they're not as expressive they don't show emotion in humans as much and uh so we don't want to just be like a form machine but at the same time since that's the weakness of um, I would argue most most drawings is the overall masses. I want you to think more about it. So think more like a sculptor. And, and you do this well. I'm I'm saying do it more. And lighting, like what it, what is going on here? Well, you know, the biggest clue you, you give us is back here. You know, you're saying, because this is like an egg, you're saying that, okay, The light is coming down and maybe is even coming towards us. Or it's doing something like this. So you are also obeying that here in the jaw, which I think is well done. Like there's a lot of consistency there. That is, I think you did a really good job with that. Um, I don't think you, we want to have a passage of light coming through here necessarily because I just don't think that um, it makes sense in terms of the form. If that's really the case, though, like our cast shadows are going to be coming down in this direction, which means this is probably cast shadow. This, which I think is what you've implied here, is going to be cast shadow. But you don't want to end the cast shadow on the sternocleidomastoid, which, by the way... I, I said this in a, in, a, in a recent critique, but, you know, the sternocleidomastoid is, it's got form. It's not just, it's not just a line. And 
I, I see that a lot with uh, people's work is they 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 treat it just like a, like a, a line, but it's it's a form. So it's it's wrapping around uh, the back of the head. This is the, where the mastoid process is. It wraps around to the back of the skull. It gets thinner as it moves this direction. It's got plane changes. You know, uh, we we studied this in um, our anatomy class. If you remember uh, when um, we would draw from these uh, cadaver casts, uh, we would cover this kind of thing. So you need more information about some of these forms, especially since they're so big and they're so important gesturally. It's not enough to do that. So looking at sculpture is also a great way to do that. Look at um, uh, the sculptures of the old masters, antique sculptures, and and uh, draw from them because sculpture is form, and that's a great way. To, it's a great way to study it. So yes, this has got to have more gesture, and we've got to get more of a sense that it's wrapping around and coming forward. It's got a tail here. Got trapezius coming back here, which is then going back here. So this is, yeah, this area is a little too flat, but what I was saying about the sternocleidomastoid is that you don't want to run your cast shadow right along that because then it doesn't look like a cast shadow. Like what's really happening here is you've got like our, fa our facial mask here is then casting This whole thing is casting a shadow onto the the neck, and that shadow depends on where the, the light is, obviously. But that shadow is going to have a shape to it, and it's going to model not only the form that is casting the shadow, but the form underneath it. So we want to find a way to um, show form more with this. So it could be that this maybe is in cast shadow, which is would make sense, you know, the ear is part of this thing that's casting the shadow. It could be that we're seeing this cast shadow move off of the sternocleidomastoid and come around. That could be that's something that's happening. Um, but we don't want to flatten it out. And then, so the cast shadows, and we do have a cast shadow here under the nose, which is where more or less where we'd expect it. But remember, it's being cast from this direction, so you're reacting to the, the nasal labial furrow, which is coming up here. But the way you've done the cast shadow, yeah, you're putting the edge on the wrong side. It's more like it's casting from here. So this is the, this is the surface that is, that is gonna be darker. And it's moving in this direction. It's moving over the form this way. And, no matter, and you know, you can subdue how far this cast shadow goes, obviously, generally, for um, purposes of making the drawing work or portrait work. We don't, we don't usually hit this cast shadow as hard as we could. Like, look at the $1 bill and how the portrait of George Washington looks you know these cast shadows are under the nose are often soft softened or they are even eliminated because they can be distracting and we want to see the face but yeah they're coming from here keep that in mind and in it, like in this case the brow is turning down and it's it's a form turning away let's just treat it sort of like it's a form that's turning away and then whatever cast shadow might be happening is happening down here. So those are, and you, you, you're sort of doing that. And there's also obviously the local color of the brow, but we need more, we need more form. So one thing that we can do that will help us, uh, and I know I've had you, you do this in class before in the past, but we need to run lines over the forms. It will help us start to see it on the real form. And so even if you don't know, all the anatomy, let's say, or you don't know how this thing fits together, if you start drawing lines across your form, even if they're light and they're just for you, you can, it will help you start to think about, I mean, it's not like, again, I say this often, it's not all about this, this, 
I mean, these are important parts. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. There's, it's also all of this and all of this and all of this and all of this. And so we, in order, uh, one way we can study, we can um, study that is to run lines over our form. So if I run lines over the forms you've drawn, here's what I get. If I'm just doing this, it's, it's uh, our brains do this automatically. It's how we perceive. So we perceive the world three dimensionally. Like we have to do this, and so I know that these are not the correct forms anatomically, but that's what you're telling me is happening with your modeling. And this is these are not the forms. The forms, um, what well, what I would expect the forms to be, are going to be more like the, like there's the corner is actually here. We've got the frontal eminence, which needs to turn away. And depending on how strong the temporalis muscle is, how full it is, it's going to come down and maybe it's going to, because the, the cheekbone is, is going to curve around here and it's wide there. So it's got to be full. And then our masseter is coming back this way. We've got a corner. But and then Probably when you're looking at anything or anything, uh, your reference, let's say when you're drawing, you need to be able to run these mental lines over the form. Essentially, you need to be able to see what the form is actually doing, because then when you can see that, you can do more sophisticated drawings. When a lot of artists talk about um, the Terminator line, and this is sort of a shorthand that um, Illustrators, uh, academic artists will use sometimes where I was sort of talking to you about, okay, let's say there's this shape. This is sort of what I was criticizing. Let's say there's this shape that wasn't actually meant to be a, be a face. It just became a face. And then let's say, okay, within here, there are more lines. And then we use a core shadow or terminator, which is, we're copying this most likely. And then, oh, we're going to fill all this in. And then we're going to model our half tones really lightly. So it is sort of this is sort of a a shorthand graphic approach. And I think that the 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 downside of this approach is that it's flat. You don't learn to see form. It can't be applied easily to drawing from imagination and it and it is just it's not as um, masterful a drawing technique as being able to see the three-dimensional form. So that's what we want. To do, we we want to avoid. Sometimes we think we're being three D, and if we really think about it, like the truth is, we don't really know where these forms are. We're not really thinking about it, and we're resorting to copying two D uh, shapes only rather than than building this. And so, a good exercise, especially like you know, with the portrait, it's so much about this, it's so much about this um, this outer contour. But try to think about all of the form. So. You know, and you might need to draw some of the anatomy to help you work out what the form is actually doing. It might. I mean, anatomy is. I mean, anatomy is something. It's not something you need to study in and of itself. It, it's what it should be. What it should be is a means to an end. It's just a way of. It's a way of understanding and remembering these subtle forms of nature that are hard to perceive. So anatomy is teeth end up here. So and this stuff is going to be buried deeper than we think. So anatomy is it's just so it's a way to help you get to these to the these concepts of form that I, that I'm that I'm talking about. And it's not the only way. You can also just study art of the past. You can study the patterns 
of how artists in the past have done this, how other artists have done this. Think of like comic books. There's sort of there's almost like handed down traditions of how to do a leg like this, how to do an arm like this. You know, you've got these, um, you've got these ways of handling things that are handed down, and that's the same as like you know, um, icon painters, you know, or whatever the tradition is, or woodblock artists. So it's either a tradition that's handed down and how we think of these things, you know, like planes of the head, the Riley abstraction, these are these are versions of that. So there's there's sort of like a tr an artistic tradition that is is handed down that we can use, but anatomy is also another way to do that. I mean, generally you're you're usually not learning the anatomy yourself. You're usually letting it it's interpreted by a teacher an artist for you. But even the way that anatomy is interpreted is um is, is relevant to what we're getting so the purpose is not the anatomy the purpose is to get the clarity of form that's what we want so you can do i mean you can do diagrams you can like i don't have anything in front of me right now but if you put a real skull in front of you um or one of our 3d models like from the website of the cadavers like the goldfinger elia goldfinger's uh, cadaver head or i think you might actually have one of the castings we did so you can bring those in front of you, but you need to be analyzing and trying to figure out more what is going on here. And you can do it with reference. There's no, there's no, like these usually tends to be round because it's the actual masseter. And this is on your face, actually. You have very strong masseters, I remember looking at you and thinking that. So, um, you know, you need to start figuring out what the forms are. Like that's not easy to do. And then once you do that, when you're drawing, you need to allow that to help you make these decisions. And so before we were talking about how, and then we can also think of the, the head obviously as an egg going this way. That's another way of doing it. But if this is basically what's happening from a form perspective, now we're doing something like this. And then these are, if, if something like if this is sort of what's happening, then it's not just, you know, the core shadows or the occlusion shadows. It's going to be how these forms are turning, how the light is actually turning. And so, okay, so our light's coming down. And then as the, as our forms turn away from that light, we're modeling it. Well, if we have a clearer idea of what the form is doing, then we can, we can draw in a more advanced way. So like as we're moving over the, if we know the frontal eminence is here, we can, and not even getting into the, the main um, core shadows, but just the modeling. And there's a reason everybody uses the Terminator and these binary systems is that they're much easier. But you don't want to have to, um, you don't want to have to rely on that if you know that this plane is sort of wrapping under. And it's not just, ha I mean, I'm using like a hatching method. I usually draw that way, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be like soft tones like you're, you're doing here. Like here, this, there's, this is just, this is just uh, no man's land. But in reality, we've got fat pad. And then this can actually break in different ways there. It depends on the person. There's a lot of variety there. But these forms are coming from around. And this is, this is breaking. So when you have more, um, if you're thinking more, not even acknowledging, but if you're thinking more about the structure, you, you have more options in your drawing about how you're handling it. You just have more freedom, you have more possibilities, which you, if you were just, my face is really probably too close to the microphone because I'm kind of leaning in right now. But if you were just uh, copying shapes, you have uh, far fewer opportunities
This is wide. Cheekbones down here. So this is, I think you're curving that prematurely and then I think you got soup fat and roof fat and all these different uh, elements. And then this is stuff is coming up here. And then yeah, we are coming down here. But this this mouth is is um it it's looking flat. So I mean we're more or less level. So let's say the, the other corner of the mouth is around here. Maybe it's back there. Something extreme. It's going all the way around, and when we can't see it, and then the lip is going all the way around, and then see here it turns out, and this is coming. This is going all the way around. It's departing right here, but you have to. And whatever the characteristic is of this person, of this person, because all these forms, you know, develop and have different qualities depending on the person. But you need to get that to turn around three dimensionally more. But and then. As you start to be able to, which you, you know, you are doing this, but as you start to, if you know, and if you can, if I can sort of like drop you like a little climber, if this was massive and you know how to climb up the, these forms in any direction, then like I say, you have more, um, there's more possibilities, but even including like, like gestural possibilities, like, like, oh, I want to, I mean, think of like Dürer or these other old masters, you can you know, run rhythms, you can go any way you want, you can go all the way around here. And and, and all of the, the rendering technique and the way you're dealing with light and shadow and all of that stuff becomes more powerful. So more, what you're doing well is what you need to do more of, you know.